You've heard of the butterfly effect. A butterfly flaps its wings on the other side of the world. By the time it gets to us, it's a hurricane. It's the idea that little things can have big consequences. Now, this is especially true about the choices we make when we're young. You see, every decision ripples out into our world and our future in ways that we can't possibly imagine and we carry them to the end of our days. The choices we're making right now can affect our long-term health, our ability to get a job, our future spouse, our kids, our grandkids, everything. What you do will always be with you. But there is one choice that towers over all the rest. Get it right, and every bad decision you've ever made can be wiped away. Get it wrong, and a lifetime of good choices will one day turn to dust. When you choose to follow the Creator, when you choose to surrender your ways to Him, when you decide to trust Him with your life, you will have figured out the one choice that really matters. You see, the beat of a butterfly's wing may or may not change the world, but the choice to follow Christ will change you and countless others forever. Well, I was at a concert last night. I got to go to a Jason Gray concert. And, um, yes, and... uh, you know, one of the comments online about Jason Gray, he's a Christian recording artist, and uh, there was about 150 people there, not, not a huge crowd. It was out, or outdoor amphitheater in, in um, Walker. Um, but somebody on the comments said he's one of the more underrated uh, songwriters in Christian music today, and he certainly is. His lyrics are so profound and so incredibly powerful. And he was telling a story in there about a joke that is often used You've probably heard it. Maybe you've used it. You know, it's the guy that introduces his wife to somebody at the work Christmas party and says, yeah, I'm the guy she puts up with, you know, and we kind of chuckle about it. Maybe you've used that joke in the past. And he said, but he he thought about that joke and is it really helpful? And he said he wondered if sometimes we don't maybe view God in that sense, that we kind of come along and we're kind of like, well, yeah, I'm the guy that God just puts up with. We live with ourselves, we know the mess our life is, we know the bad choices we make, we know the struggles that we encounter and deal with, and we look in the mirror and we think, yeah, God just kind of puts up with me, and uh, that is a very poor reality. Hopefully you don't have that picture of God (laughs) through all the preaching over the years here at the church. God does not put up with us, but God is constantly working on us, and um, he has this song called Becoming, it's a brilliant got a brilliant lyric at the end but here's some of the lyrics in this and and uh, just this this concept here and this opening illustration is is embedded in this song i am miles from where i was yet so far from where i want to be with each step i learn to trust the maker is still making me and i'm becoming i i'm becoming Life is a house full of rooms, each door opens to another door. I can't walk into something new till I leave behind where I was before, because I'm becoming, I'm becoming. And then here's the chorus. It's progress, not perfection, not arrival, it's direction. It's the living and the learning, not the finish line, but the journey, because I'm becoming, I'm becoming who I am. I thought, what a brilliant lyric. That is the summary of what we preach here all the time, right? We are in the process of becoming who we are in Christ. Christ has done a work in us, and we're just coming to realize the fullness of who we are in Christ. And that's been so beautifully illustrated in this series. We could look at the series and really understand Galatians kind of in this way, that the first four chapters, Paul is really driving down our foundation of our faith and where it's rooted, and this idea of justification by faith, not by works, but by faith, by what Christ did on the cross, and that's the foundation of this entire book, and then we come to chapter five, and it's, he's going to kind of shift into the practical reality of all this foundational truth, and here's the practical nature of it all, is that freedom in Christ is the pinnacle of the book. It's like we've exited now the expressway, the freeway, and we're traveling up this mountain to the top of this beautiful mountain where we're going to see the the wonder of our true freedom in Christ which I think we so fully underestimate 
I often, we have throughout this series gone back to the book of Galatians, repeatedly to those two trees in the book of Galatians and to Adam and Eve. And, and I think really any sermon I would ever preach, you could go back to Adam and Eve and to Galatians because their story is our story and everything begins there and everything ties back there. And Adam, of course, is the representative of, of all mankind. We're all in sin because of Adam and he is the first Adam and, and there's so much he ties into all of life. But there are three parallels here that I think we should note about Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are in the garden. I mentioned this last week, right? And they are entirely free. They are free in Christ in the Garden of Eden, and they don't even know they're free, but they're free. They have never uh, experienced being enslaved to any negative emotions or destructive behavior or anything or, or devastating choices until they make a devastating choice. And then it's like, oops, yeah, we were free. That's what freedom was. I didn't know that was free. And, and it, here's the thing. When you come to Christ and put your faith and trust in Christ, you are as free in Christ as Adam and Eve were in the garden. That, that's, and that's hard to comprehend because we live in a world that is enslaved and we have all the memories up here in our brain. We're trained up here. We have all these memories of what it's like to be enslaved to our desires and our passions and the lusts of the flesh and all of our legalistic tendencies to try to earn our, our favor with God through what we do. And so there's that first part. We're as free as Adam and Eve. And here's the thing. Likewise, we are free and we don't fully appreciate it. There is a freedom we have in Christ and I don't think we fully grasp how wonderful, that, how free we are in Christ. We just don't get that freedom and appreciate it. Adam and Eve didn't and I don't think we really do as much as we should and that's takes us to the third parallel that every day freedom is a daily choice. Freedom is a daily choice for those of us who are in Christ. We, ch- we can choose to live at the tree of life, the tree of promise, of grace, or we can ch- choose to live over here in the tree of, of the flesh and law and work and legalism and license to sin. All of that is a daily choice Adam and Eve had that choice every day. Would they depend on Christ? Would they fellowship with the Spirit? Would they trust in the authority of the Father? Or would they go their own way? And we know that eventually they went their own way. And we've been struggling with the ramifications of that now for the last 6,000 years. So Paul's going to take us up the mountain today to the peak of Galatians to see the freedom that we have in Christ, to really appreciate it. And to remind us that we don't want to be enslaved to the elementary principles of this world. Remember this verse back in in Galatians 4. Formerly when you were Gentiles, formerly when you Gentiles did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather be known by God, how can you turn your back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? So don't go back Don't go back to your thinking, your old man thinking, and get enslaved to the ways of this world. Know that you are free in Christ. And the ironic thing really is this, is that true freedom in Christ is when we live as a slave of Christ. The more you live as a slave of Christ, the less you're a slave of this world and a slave of your emotions and and your fears and your anxieties and your worry and your self-effort and all of that stuff. You become a slave of Christ when you depend on Christ. That's what it's all about. Here's our big idea today. To embrace our freedom in Christ, we must depend upon Christ. And I'll put it to you straight. The more you depend upon Christ in life, the freer you're going to be. It's just that simple. And yet it's tough sometimes to choose to depend upon Christ because we want to trust ourselves. So that is the reality. Will we trust ourselves or will we depend on Christ? Now today we have three specific choices that are going to help us understand this and they're all found in this verse right here, the pinnacle verse of Galatians for freedom. Christ has set us free. Stand firm therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. There's three choices in here and then in the three next paragraphs, verses 2 through 15, he takes each one of these and kind of expounds on them. I've never seen it this way before but it really lays out beautifully and here's our three choices. Really our three choices are simply this It is seeing, standing, and submitting. Seeing, standing, and submitting are the three choices, and they're going to lead to three practical applications here. And so let's jump in here and let's embrace our freedom. Here's the first one, seeing our freedom in Christ. For freedom, Christ has set us free. You need to see that you are as free as Adam and Eve were in the garden. That is your freedom. You have that in Christ. You simply do. And we live in a world that's not free and we have the memories and habits of our mind. We know what it's like to be enslaved to this world. But truth is, we're free if we choose to live 
every day as if we are free. John 8, 36, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You, you will be free. If the Son set you free, you are free. Now, the reality is freedom is a daily choice. Freedom is a daily, every day it's a choice, will I live in my freedom or not? Now, this choice can be seen in two ways in the text here. Verses two through four, we see that salvation is a choice. Look at what he says in verses two through four. Look, here's what he says. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are, in, you, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. Now, how do we understand that? Well, the best way to understand that is pretty much how you're hearing it this morning from me, how any church congregation might hear it anywhere. You're hearing it, and, and there's a mixed audience. Paul is speaking to these Galatians. Everybody he's speaking to is not a believer. So Paul says, note, note his, his, uh, his pronouns there. Look, I, Paul, say to you, I say to every man, every man out there, if you're looking to be justified by circumcision and by the law, and going back to the Jewish practices, let me, let me just tell you, you are, he's, he's blunt. He is extremely blunt in how does he lay it out? What are the three things he lays out for them? Christ is of no advantage to you. You are severed from Christ and you have fallen from grace. You've fallen from grace in the law. I've given you grace. I've preached grace. And there are some that just have not received this message of grace. And he says, if you're trusting something other than Christ, you are severed from Christ. He is no advantage to you and you have fallen from grace. Grace was offered to them. Christ was preached to them. And some have not received it. They have, they have, they have made a, a choice. And so freedom is a choice. It's a one-time choice. I want to be free. Set me free. Lord, I come to you believing that if I put my faith and trust in you, you will set me free. Now, also, we see this in verses 5 and 6. This is the other side of freedom. Look, look, look at the verb, look at the pronouns in here. For through the Spirit by faith, we ourselves, me, Paul, me and my ministry team, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision uncirc- counts for anything, but only faith working through love. And now Paul is saying, for those of us who are in Christ, we are eagerly waiting for the hope of righteousness. There is a, there is a freedom we have in Christ that is ruling our lives, that is, that, is, that is reigning within us, that is guiding us every single day. There is this freedom we have in Christ and we just need to know that. So this is living in the freedom of your salvation is a choice. Being set free is a choice. We, you know, you make that choice one time. You either choose to be set free or not or you can hang on to all of your baggage, all of your sin, all of your unrighteousness. You can remain dead in your sins and, 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 or you can choose to be free. And then once you choose to be free every day, living in the freedom of your salvation is a choice. Living in the hope of that righteousness that Paul talks about. Now take note here, there are some advantages found in Christ. He says if you don't know Christ, if you're severed from Christ, Christ is of no advantage to you. But if you have Christ, there are some advantages. What are those advantages? I'll, I'll give you three of them here. Christ does what the law cannot do. Just think about that. Christ will do what the law cannot do. What can the law do? Well, the law can say you're guilty. The law can say you're a sinner. The law can say you broke me. But the law can't do anything about it, can it? The law certainly cannot set us free. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And we know in this verse, the truth is a person. The truth is Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there's only freedom found through Christ. He will set you free. Whatever's, whatever's imprisoning you today, whatever, whatever you're a slave of today, whatever fear, whatever emotion, whatever behavior, whatever thought, Christ can set you free every single day. You just need to know that. And so this is the, the reality. The law can do, or the Christ can do what the law cannot do. The law can only point out our sin. Christ can actually take care of our sin. You see, the, the, the law, as great as it is, think about this as great as the law is you know what don't violate it (laughs) but Jesus if you violate it isn't it great there's Jesus when you violate the law when you break the law it's kind of like the law is kind of like the speeding ticket you get the speeding ticket that you can't pay and you're like oh and then Jesus comes along and pays the speeding ticket and says you're free the law says you're guilty and Christ comes along and says not anymore 
Isn't that great, though, that Christ does what the law cannot do? Here's the second thing. Christ interprets the nuance of the law. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, but what does that mean? This is a, this is a huge, a huge advantage of the law, or a huge advantage of, of Christ helping us interpret the nuance of the law. What of the law says thou shalt not lie, right? We all know what it is to lie. That's cut and dry, right? Well, what about, what about this verse? We read, we read this last week, actually. 2 Corinthians 3, such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And there's a difference between the letter of the law and the Spirit of the law. I'll give you an example. So the, Israelite, the Israelites... They, they send the spies into Jericho, right, before they defeat it, and they, they send them in, and, and they go in, and they knock on the door of Rahab. They have a little conversation with Rahab. And a few hours later that night, the people of Jericho come and knock on the door of Rahab. Hey, Rahab, have you seen the Israelite slaves? And what's Rahab's response? What slaves? All while she's what? Hiding them on her roof. How many think Rahab lied? Did she lie? Yeah. According to the letter of the law, she lied. But you know what she kept? She did. She kept the spirit of the law. Because you know what she did? She loved God most, and she put her neighbors, the Israelites, first. She risked her life. And so that's the difference, and that's what Christ does for us, helps us interpret in real time the nuance of the law. How do I live the law out in real time? Not just the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. How do I love my neighbor as myself? The very end of this passage, and you, maybe you remember when Derek read this, verses 13 and 14. Here's what he says. Through love serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's what Rahab did. Even while she lied, literally lied, and broke the letter of the law, no, she kept the spirit of the law. Because she loved God most. And that's what God helps us do to understand. I'm not saying kids, it's okay to lie and say, oh, Jesus told me it was, no, that's not what I'm saying. But truly, Christ in us helps us know the right answer at the right time. And then um, one other example here is that Christ offers us his spiritual blessings. There's two of them he mentions here in verses five and six. And note here in these two verses, note the source or the, the foundation of this blessing and then what the blessing is. But he says, for through the Spirit... So, so through the Holy Spirit, there's this blessing, this spiritual blessing, and it's the blessing we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. And that simply means that when I came to Christ, when I was saved, Christ took all of my sin on himself and gave me all of his righteousness. I'm as righteous as Christ, so I'm right with God. So when I die, I have this hope that I can go to heaven and be with Christ forever because I... Not because I earned anything, because I'm, I have the righteousness of Christ. He has made me a new creation and the hope of righteousness, that's an amazing thing, to live every day with the hope of righteousness, to just know that no matter what I do, no matter what sin I commit, no matter, no matter how I fail in my Christian walk, I'm righteous. There's a hope there that nothing can take that righteousness away from me. That's a spiritual blessing. And can I just contend to you, that's something the law cannot offer you. I, no matter, in fact, it's the exact opposite. All the law does is say, oh, you broke me again. Loser. No, Christ says here, I'll give you the hope of righteousness. And then Christ offers us his spiritual blessings in verse six. Note this one, the source, the foundation is in Christ. So those who are in Christ Jesus. And remember we said 216 times Paul uses this phrase in his letters. In Christ Jesus, he says it's faith working through love. It's not about circumcision or uncircumcision. It's not about just our physical outward obedience. It's where's our heart? There are a lot of people in Jesus' day that were very obedient, but their heart was in the wrong place. And here he's saying it's faith working through love. And can I just say that when the faith of Christ in me is responding to the love of God for me, I will be more obedient than ever. That's what it's all about, friends. That's what you want. It's the faith of Christ responding to the love of God that will empower me to go out 
and be obedient and, and, and love my neighbor as myself and fulfill the nuance of the law. And that's what carried Christ to the cross, right? It was the faith of Christ working through his love for the Father and for you and I that sent him to the cross, that he offered up his life for all of us. Again, to embrace our freedom in Christ, we must depend upon Christ. It is that simple. To embrace our freedom in Christ, we must depend upon Christ. Okay, standing firm when you are attacked for Christ. This is our second principle. Standing firm when you are attacked for Christ. He says, stand firm then. Stand firm then. And and just think about the simplicity of that. And it's interesting when you think of Adam and Eve in the garden, right? And you think of, of of Satan coming and tempting them with those two trees, you know, and, and coming in. And that's the first spiritual attack in the Bible. And what was he attacking? He was attacking their freedom. They were free in Christ. And he's like, hey, you know what? I'm going to entice you over here and I'm going to take away your freedom. I'm going to enslave you. I'm going to spiritually kill you. I'm going to wreck your life. And every day, that's the choice we have, whether we will live in the freedom we have in Christ. And it's as simple as standing. It really is. And here's the the point, is that living in freedom is a spiritual battle. Every day it's a spiritual battle. We will fight this battle every day to live in freedom. Just know that. Just know that. Here it is in Ephesians chapter 6. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand of the devil. Verse 13, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to, able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. When he says in Galatians here, stand therefore, he repeats it throughout his writings several times. He uses this phrase, stand. There is this reality that is ours in Christ. Stand on your freedom. Stand on your righteousness. Stand on what I did. That's where freedom is found. It's really a picture of David and Goliath, right? That David went out to take on Goliath and David just went out and declared victory before it even happened. He said, hey, you're you're dead. You're mine because you've defied my God and my God said, I got victory over you and he went out and he slayed him. And that's the same attitude we have to have, the victory and freedom that we have in Christ and not live a defeated life life defeated attitude verses 11 and 12 here's what he says but if i brothers still preach circumcision why am i still being persecuted in that case the offense of the gospel has been removed here's a handful of ways and this is the first one where our freedom in in a sense will be attacked where a spiritual attack will come along to impact our freedom and one is our defense of the gospel will be attacked it will be The gospel itself is under attack all the time. The fact that Christ is enough, the fact that that he died and rose again, it's under attack in so many ways. The gospel, I said it a million times, the gospel is so simple, but it's not easy. If it was easy, everybody would get saved. If it was easy believism, everybody would be saved and just live it up afterward, but that's not the way it works. The gospel isn't easy. Because you have to humble yourself. You have to say, I need Christ. I need to depend on him. I can't do it on my own. And you can't genuinely get saved and go out and live your old life of of sin and revelry. Just you can't go. You know why you can't do that? Do you understand why you can't do that? Because when you genuinely get saved, God gives you his heart, becomes your identity, and changes your desires. If you're genuinely saved, you just don't want those same things. Now, you struggle in the flesh, and we struggle with our memories of how we used to behave and respond and act, and <clears throat> we struggle with wanting to fit in and be liked, and I'm not saying we don't struggle, but I'm saying God changes us inside, and so there's a real struggle there. Here's, a, here's another example of, of uh, where we're attacked, uh, verses 7 through 9. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And our stance on the truth is going to be attacked. I mean, it's not just the gospel. It's a standing for the truth will be attacked today. The truth is not always popular. The truth is often counter the culture. The truth is often politically incorrect, and we just need to know that. And I think it is the thing that will divide the church today. Will we simply stand on the church? There is a huge church in Cincinnati. I won't give you a lot of commentary here, but there's a huge church in Cincinnati, Crossroads Church. They did a series on, you know, difficult issues in society today, and they brought a special guest in, speaker from this big organization. He came in and talked about 
children transgendering. That whole, that, whole, that whole messy kind of thing. And of course, what do you think happened? They got protested outside the church. People that go to the church were upset. And so the pastor tried to apologize while standing for the truth, and you can't do that. You don't, you don't, don't even broach the subject if you're going to apologize for talking about it. It's a real issue in our world today. It's a messy issue in our world today. It needs to be treated with love and grace, but it needs to be treated with the truth. You need to speak the truth on these things and not apologize. And if you stand for the truth, you're going to be attacked. My, my whole thought was, why did they even broach the subject if you didn't know you were going to be attacked for dealing with that? Our faith in Christ will be attacked. He says, you were running well, who hindered you? <clears throat> and I was thinking about this reality. You know, these Galatians are running the race, they're doing really well, and then they trip up, they get stumbled by these Judaizers and they fall. But here's the thing I was thinking, because our freedom in Christ is, is tethered so closely to our faith in Christ, uh, it's going to be attacked. And here's the thing. The gospel, the truth, and our faith are all intertwined. And one of the things you oftentimes hear today, we hear it all the time, right? That, that truth is like relative or subjective, and it's not absolute. You hear that all the time. And what's really com comical is you hear this sometimes in, in these universities, and you might get a Christian professor who will come back and push back on the kids with this. It doesn't happen often. But here's the thing. So kids today are, are like, well, yeah, truth. you got to own your own truth. you got to figure out your own truth. We all have our own truth. There's no right or wrong. Until what? Until they're wronged, you know. Once they're wronged, well, that was wrong because, you know, that affected me. And, and that's the point. There is an absolute right and wrong. If someone steals your phone, that was wrong. So there are absolute right and wrongs. And so there's not this sense where, you know, we all come up with our own way to Christ. We all come up with our own truth. It's, no, there's an absolute truth. There's an absolute gospel. But I will say this. You could say that we come up with our own faith. And what is our faith? But our faith is when we take the truth of the gospel and, 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 and we personify it in our life, when we employ it in our life, when, when the truth that is absolute, when the gospel that is concrete comes alive in me, that's my faith. And it looks different in all of us as it comes alive and as we handle it. But we all have to have our own faith. We all have to make our own choice for Christ to be set free. And we all have to make our own choice every day to live in that freedom. And to not live in the flesh, but to live in the spirit. That's simply the reality. So, just be aware of that. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. My faith can indeed grow as I stand firm on the truth and the gospel, even when going through great difficulty. And then going back to that again, I, I would throw this out there, that yes, um, our faith our freedom in Christ will be attacked. He says, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. So these Gentiles are being persuaded by these Judaizers. They're being persuaded to go back to the law and to lose sight of their grace they have in Christ and their freedom in Christ. And so he's saying, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. It's, it's not from the Father. It's from these Judaizers. And there are those that don't like your freedom. And they didn't like their freedom in Christ. These, these Judaizers did not like the fact that the Gentiles could come to Christ apart from the law. They did not like that. They were, I, I would say they were jealous. Kind of like the prodigal brother. Remember, the prodigal son had that party and he came back and he got grace. And the prodigal brother's like, he hasn't been working. I have been working. You know, hey, this, don't, this ain't fair. It's like... And, and the point is you, you, you have to learn that you can't work. If you're working, then it's not grace. If, it's, if, if you're working, you're not depending on Christ. And so people will not like our freedom in Christ. It will simply be attacked, be aware of that. And we can all, in ways, be legalistic. I remember growing up, learned this from my mom and dad. I had to grow out of this. I think they've probably grown out of it too. But we grew up and it's like, man, alcohol. You can't drink alcohol if you're a Christian. I mean, come on. You can't have wine. You can't drink a beer. That was a, hard for me for a long time to come to the point of realizing in Christ we are free to drink alcohol. There's nowhere in the Bible that says you can't drink alcohol. But we, we all can find our things. I drink too much soda, so... And uh, so one more here, our, uh, our emotional, here's it is, I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. 
I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves and simply our emotional state will be attacked. Our emotional state is so tied to our spiritual reality. It, it certainly is. And we just need to know that our emotional state is going to be attacked and these Gentiles were troubled in their soul. They were worried. They were anxious. They were frustrated. They were like, oh, what is true? What is not true? And Paul was really frustrated with this simple reality. Colossians 4.12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greet you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and, and be fully assured in all the will of God. There is a spiritual maturity that we can find in Christ, a spiritual maturity that brings us and gives us freedom in Christ, an emotional stability that we want to govern our lives by. Let me give you one more passage here that ties in. Listen to what Paul said. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by many words of winds of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth and love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, even Christ. Into Christ. And, and so there's this sense of spiritual maturity and it's one of the reasons why it's good that you're here today. It's, it's a good thing that you, you listen to the word, that you, that, you, you, that you feast on the word, that you feed your spirit, that you feed your soul so that your, your emotions aren't just all over the place. This last year has been really bad for that, right? I mean, we've just been all over the place. Fear and anxiety and worry and doubt and frustration and anger and depression and all kinds of things consuming us. And we need to be tethered to the word of God and feeding our spirit and feeding our soul so that we can be free emotionally. We can have emotional stability right here based on our spiritual maturity. That is so true. Here's a few examples of what this looks like in our life. When a relationship breaks down or we lose a loved one, we can be attacked emotionally. Which one of these, maybe as I go through these, would you relate to? How about this? When we face an injustice, are you facing an injustice right now that's attacking you? When we battle depression or addiction, when we battle depression or addiction, how about when we find ourselves thinking destructive thoughts? How about this one? When we find ourselves believing a lie, all of these are areas where we can be attacked and we can be emotionally unstable. How about when we struggle with not being in control? Amen, anybody? Now, I'll go back through those again, and I just want you to think about the freedom that you have in Christ today. Think about the freedom we have in Christ when a relationship breaks down. We are free to mourn that relationship, to grieve, to anger, to pray, to believe, to hope. How about this one? When we face an injustice, we are free to forgive that injustice, free to know that Christ has gotten us our justice at the cross. Did you know that? If you were ever treated unjustly, God gave you your justice at the cross. Just just claim that and be free in that and say, I can let that hurt, that that wrong go. Even when it's difficult, we we can know that. When we battle depression or addiction, we are free to know the hope and the mercy and the grace of Jesus. We are free to know that Jesus has experienced our deepest struggle and sin. He has touched the depth of our despair. When we find ourselves thinking destructive thoughts, we're also free from those destructive thoughts and we're free to remind ourselves that all the thoughts in my head are not my own. Did you know that? Every time you think of an ugly thought up here, you, lost, you immediately, the accuser of the brethren comes along and says, oh, you're terrible. What a, what a rotten thought. And he put the thought in our head. <laughs> you know, that's the point. It's the way he works. All the thoughts in your head are not your thoughts. And you can reject them and you can say, hey, that's not, that's not how I think. I have the mind of Christ. We are free. When we find ourselves believing in a lie, we are free to remind ourselves that the truth is in Christ. We're free from the lies of the devil. We are not who or what he says we are. We're not, the, we're not the person he says we are. And then finally, when we struggle with not being in control, we're free from not having to be in control. Just put your hands up and say, I don't have to be in control. I can relinquish control. And I'll tell you the most freeing thing you can do in your life is learn to say, I'm not in control and that's okay. 
I'm not in control what happens at my job. I'm not in control what happens, you know, in my school. Or uh, I'm not in control of so much of life. And I don't have to be because he is sovereign and he is ruling. And note something Paul says here, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And what he means there is just a little bit of self-dependence, just a little bit of trust on self and then the worries come and then the questions come and the doubts come and the fears come and the destructive thoughts come. And the more we depend on Christ, the more free we will be. To embrace our freedom in Christ, we must depend upon Christ. It's that simple. Finally, our third one, and we'll just touch on this briefly here, submitting every day to Christ. It's seeing we're free in Christ. It's standing firm when we're attacked for Christ. And then it's submitting every day to Christ. And do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Again, what's this yoke of slavery? It's what he's been talking about through the whole letter. In fact, let me show you something interesting here. Because the Bible, again, talks about the law as just in general terms. In, in chapter 6, he'll talk about the law of Christ. That's just a general, we'll explain that probably in a couple of weeks. But here he talks about, if you notice what he does different, and this is a different translation. Notice what this translation does. And it's helpful. The New American Standard Bible, and I testify again to every man who has, who has himself circumcised that he is obligated to keep the whole law. Know what they do there with law. They capitalize L. And this translation does that anytime it talks about the Mosaic law, the law of Moses, it capitalizes it with an L. So you're obligated. You're under the whole law, which is the 603 civil and ceremonial and sacrificial laws and the Big Ten, the moral laws. We're under all of that if you go back to circumcision. That's the point. That's the point Paul's been making throughout this letter. And so Paul says, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Why? Because there's a better option. You can be a slave of who? You can be a slave of Christ. Isn't that better than being a slave of the law? And so here's, look at it this way. Instead of obedience to a law, God is calling us to dependence on a person. He's calling us to dependence on a person, not just obedience to a law. I've shared this before. This is another great little quip by Andrew Farley who explains this so beautifully. Think about this. When it comes to the ceremonial law, we trust the blood of Christ. We believe the ceremony, all the sacrifices were ended with the blood of Christ. When it comes to the civil law, all those rules, and regu- you know, we trust the death of Christ. The, 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 the veil was ripped in two. Well, let me tell you today, when it comes to the moral law, the Ten Commandments, we can trust the life of Christ. He will fulfill those in us every single day with all the varied nuance, better than we can ourselves. And that's the point Paul's making We are free from law. Now we are to depend upon a person. And the whole whole question, you know, because I know we've had great discussions in Sunday school about this, and it's tough to kind of wrap your heads around what place does the law play in our life? And sometimes that question raises the scenario. It's like, well, today then, I don't have to keep the law, so I don't want to keep the law, so I'll just violate the law. Well, no. Romans 6 again. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart. You've become obedient. You are obedient to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. So I'm a slave of right. I have the hope of righteousness. I'm a slave of righteousness. The law, it's written right here. I'll just naturally, if I trust Christ, will fulfill the law in every varied nuance that it has. That's the beauty of it. Do not submit again to yoke, yoke of slavery. And it reminds me of this. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Reminds me of this verse right here. <clears throat> Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find a rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Depend on a person. Yoke yourselves to Christ. It's not how well I obey the law, it's how much I depend upon Christ. That is the reality. Here's the final verses here, and this is where we'll kind of pick up next week. But he says, You are called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And just stop there a minute. Did you see something beautiful? 
if you go back to put yourself under law, you're obligated to what? Keep the whole law. If you depend on a person and you simply love your neighbor, what has happened? You have fulfilled the entire law. So you can go back over here and try really hard to keep all of the law to be perfect and right and good enough for God. Or you can go over here and you can just say, I'm going to love my neighbor as myself and I'm going to trust the Father and you fulfill the whole thing just by depending on a person. Finally, verse 15, if you bite and devour one another, watch that you are not consumed by one another. Two applications here. Serving to Christ, uh, submitting to Christ is serving each other and we'll get into that next week more in the fruits of the Spirit. We submit to Christ by serving each other and not putting ourselves first and submitting to Christ to surrendering to Christ. Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but use it as an opportunity for the Spirit. And so when I surrender, when I submit to Christ, I'm surrendering to the Spirit. I mean, I mean, think about what that means. Think about the freedom that I then have. Think about the freedom that I have then. I am free to forgive even when the law doesn't demand it. Because Christ does, right? I'm supposed to forgive like Christ does. So I'm free to forgive. I'm free to love anyone, not because we have to, but because the fullest expression of of Christ is to love. I'm free to trust even when we can't see the waters parted or the giant felled. I'm free to trust when I can't see or I don't understand. And, And I'm free to walk boldly before the throne of grace every day when I stumble and when I fall. I am free to just walk boldly before that throne of grace. I was at the concert last night and there's this little kid running around down the hill and he's running up and down and he would keep falling. I don't know if he was falling intentionally and kind of rolling or he just was running so fast he would keep falling and we don't want to intentionally fall but there's a beauty there that this kid would fall and immediately just pick himself back up and laugh. And it's like we fall and we lay down there and we say, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. And God just wants us to jump up and say, you're free. You're free. You're, you're the hope of righteousness sets you free. And the fact that we didn't like that we fell, that's the point. But when you're unsaved, you fall down, you don't care. You rebel like the prodigal in the pig pen until you want a different meal. But when we're in Christ, we fall, we don't like it. That's, that's his work in our life. And we jump up and we say, thank you. And we... And we just learn to trust and depend on him. I'll leave you with this story. I'll leave you with this story. What did we learn today? To embrace our freedom in Christ, we must depend upon Christ. And then three simple choices here. Seeing our freedom in Christ. Christ has set us free. Standing firm when you're attacked for Christ. And then finally, submitting every day to Christ. Submitting every day to Christ. So let's leave with this. We're gonna take our trip. We're taking this trip. And you know, we have a destination. We're going to Freedom, California. You ever heard of Freedom, California? Anybody ever been there? I made it up, but I thought, what, you know, wouldn't you like to live in Freedom, California? That sounds great, right? So we're going to Freedom, California. And the difference between law and grace, or between law and trusting in a person, the difference between, you know, obedience to a law and dependence on a person looks like this. It's, it's the 1980s. How are you going to get to Freedom, California from Michigan? You're going to get that big atlas out, aren't you, right? You're going to look through that atlas and you're going to study that atlas and someone's going to drive and someone's going to navigate and someone's going to say, you need to, uh, we need to turn in so many miles and you need to take this route and you take that route. And uh, you know how it goes. And, and it's really stressful, isn't it sometimes stressful? And sometimes when you're doing that, and I know this because I've done some, I, I remember at least this might have been Rick's, funeral that this happened to rick and them driving to new york or something and you're like two hours and before you realize oh we missed our exit was that you guys yeah so like driving to new york and two hours later oops we missed our exit back there you know and that's the law and you got to keep it perfectly and you don't get it perfectly you get off course there's a better way what's the better way well, it's on our phones. It's on our, you know, it's our GPS system. It's, it's, it's Google Maps or MapQuest or whatever you use. And, and I just drove down to Alabama and I know how wonderful it is. And, and you got your phone and you put your destination in and it says in five miles, uh, turn right. And in one mile, turn right. And turn right now. And then it says, you know, turn left here and turn right here. And, and it'll say, turn around. <laughs> 
You know, what the, you know what the GPS, talk about the nuance, about just dealing with the nuance of the law. Here's what the, your GPS can do. You're driving along and there's road construction and the GPS will say, you need to go here. And we're like, well, really, this seems like it's quicker. But, and you go that way, so we should have gone the other way. There's road construction. Or even an accident. In real time, there's an accident on the roadway and we're driving along and there's an accident and it will take you a different route to get you where you want to go to Freedom, California in, in the most freeing fashion. It's, be- it's the beauty of it all. It's, it's the beauty. And so I drove around four or five days down there in Fairhope, Alabama and never got lost once. Just plugged the destination in, trusted it. GPSs aren't perfect. When I went to Alabama, the GPS was perfect. And uh, that's Christ. He's right here. He is the GPS system. He will help us. We won't violate his law. We won't break his law. We won't, we'll keep the, the beaut- most beautiful nuance of his law. We will love our neighbor as ourselves. We will put God first and love him most in ways we never could with an Alice. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you that you are so close. Thank you that you are right here. Thank you that you are helping us navigate life and understand the freedom we have in you. I don't know what anybody here today is struggling with, what they're enslaved to, what's got a hold of them, whether it's a behavior or an attitude or an emotion. But I know you're greater than that. I know you've set us all free. If we're in Christ, I pray for everyone in this room that they have put their faith and trust in you, that they understand the gospel is simply believing that you are who you said you are, that you went to the cross, that you died and receiving your life putting our trust in you to, to, to be our savior, to give us righteousness and to take us to heaven someday. And if we've done that, then we are free. Then Lord, help us live this week in freedom. And when we are tempted to be enslaved to the elementary principles of this world, remind us. Remind us that we're free and remind us that we are becoming who we are in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Very good. All right.